This podcast is part of the Game and Entertainment Network. Visit tgenetwork.net to find the latest episodes from all our shows. It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 158. Tonight I'm joined by Kodra. Hello. Tam. Hello. And Thalen. Hey there. And I'm really hoping we successfully record a podcast without, you know, me getting the electricity knocked out. Oh, yes, yes, please. Because storms are bearing down and so far they don't look like they're tornadic, but, you know, that can always change. Um, anyway, tonight we are recording the, uh... May? May <laughs> Game of the Month Club? <laughs> yeah, no. sorry, like, I had to pause there because, like, we're actually recording it in the month. Like, yeah. we, we've had this whole sequence of recording it, like, weeks after the month. <laughs> but yeah, so this this month we were playing, uh, Wolfenstein New Order, and that was your pick, Kodra. So, so So tell us why you picked this. I, so... I think it was after uh, Danganronpa. I, like, Danganronpa was a game where I felt like I was trapped in an authoritarian hellscape, and I really wanted to be able to smash the state. And, boy, there wasn't a better game that came to mind that for killing Nazis than Wolfenstein New Order. It's true. Um, yeah. And I also wanted this game because it's got a lot going on in it. It does and like it's you really and i have really had does. side conversations about this because we played it about the same time uh and, and ended up taking vastly different paths yeah but i mean paths is interesting there's really only one decision point that changes the game but like there is a lot of scenes and world building going on and stuff that you can pick up on or miss right and yeah namely the audio logs that you pick up Mm-hmm. The oh yeah, those audio logs are real interesting. But even like all of the little news clips that yeah. give you insight into what's been going on in this world. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I really love about this game is you can pretty much completely ignore the world and just kill all the things and focus on that if you want. But there's all of this, you know, stuff scattered around where you you can learn so much about what's going on in the world about you know the fact that new york got nuked and beijing was apparently recently destroyed and is being rebuilt or the war's still going on in africa you know things like that oh yeah well and like i was sold on this game from the moment it came out because like in high school i read a novel called fatherland which is based on this the, the same functional premise of what if the nazis weren't had won or at least had reached a point of, you know, treaty. Um, and, like, that setting always seemed interesting just because of how the world would be different. And then this game comes along and gives us a view in what that world would be different. Like, I love the fact that there are Nazi versions of pop songs that we vaguely rem memorize. Yes. And, like, they're they're all vastly different. And they're all about the state or they're all about, you know authoritarian you know ideals yes. and it's, got, it's so messed up well, you've got those... this cover singing this the blow you boot so, yeah those musicians still exist it's just freedom of expression has been extremely tamped down so all they can sing is propaganda and very very germanic stuff yeah like it's it's very clear that the state is enforcing that Germanic culture will be, you know, lauded and everything else will be stamped out. There is a moment when you are infiltrating Eisenwald prison where there are two guards who are talking to each other uh, and one is like freaking out because he and his entire family are sick and he is convinced that it's because of the concrete and the other guard is doing everything he can to be like, no, the the state is perfect. All you want to, like, what you need to do is you need to take lemon and herbal tea. 
and, and that'll it's lemon coffee. Oh, lemon coffee, and that'll that'll cure you right up. Uh, it's like it, those steak can't be wrong here. Try this old wives ta- this old wives recipe, and it's like. And, and, and please guy, don't suggest that the state is wrong. Yeah, and then and then the guy starts exhibiting signs of the illness too, and he's like, "You're sick too." It's it was one of those. Oh wow, this is how authoritarianism works. Yep. It it is you you get the people bought in so that they self perpetuate the state's power. They don't. The state doesn't need to be there overseeing everything. The citizens will do it for them. Well, and and you and you set up the concept that everything is being watched, even if it's not. Mm-hmm. Everyone thinks everything is being watched. Mm-hmm. It's far more effective to make everyone think that you're watching than to actually watch. Yes, you know that. That's why there is a market for fake security camera domes. Because you know, why pay for a real security camera when making someone think there's one there is just as good. Yep, or at least set it up so that the risk of their a- of it actually being real is too high. So, okay, funny story. Like this is this is tangential, but about the security camera thing. Like at work, they got a grant to install all these security cameras, but they did not have the money to actually wire them up to anything. So there are security cameras all over the place that aren't actually hot, but it's impossible to determine which ones are hot and which ones are not. Wow. wow. Yep. I'm not surprised at all. So this game, I, I kind of want to talk about how this game starts because yeah, we should this... definitely make sure everybody listening is aware of the concept and all of that. <laughs> right, and just heads up, like as always with Agro Chat shows, this is spoiler time, and if you're planning on playing it, then you maybe shouldn't listen to Agro Chat game of, one... of the month of shows because there is there is a lot of things that surprised me in this game, especially my first time through. Like, I don't know that I would call anything a twist necessarily, but there are definitely some moments where, like, you know, something happens that is is surprising. But this game starts, like, almost aggressively trying to look like a Call of Duty game. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like... I mean, you're storming a beach. Well, you start out in a plane going to storm a beach. You start out in a plane going to storm a beach in World War II... I feel like it is aggressively trying to be a Call of Duty game of 10 years ago. Yeah. Look, I mean, I'm going to say, like, it's one of the coolest intros as far as action combat. Like, like all of the sequences of of taking stuff down and then scaling the wall and Mm -hmm. that stuff was all badass. I mean, like, I, I loved every minute of that. Oh, and by the way, you're you're going you're on a plane going to storm a beach in World War II in 1946. Yes. That's the first clue that something's not right. Yeah. I mean, the second clue is these German... Jet fighters. Oh, were they... I didn't even notice those were jet fighters. Yeah, yeah, no, they, they were. Yeah. They are not prop planes. Yeah. They're these weird, like, V-shaped jets. You are you are in 1946-era technology prop planes, and you're well, fighting well, jets. Of note, like, if I remember correctly, like, there were designs that were found that were never actually put into play because they didn't know how to make the technology work yet. But, like, there were there were flying V designs. Yeah. Most most of those, though, even were still were props. Were still things. props, yeah. Like, the, the, the one in um, the, Cap- the first Captain America movie, the giant flying V, that's the sort of thing that was, that they were imagining. And the stuff that's showing up in this game is far beyond that even. <laughs> Yeah, and then you get on the beach and there is a giant walker striding around, taking things out. Like, like so, tens of stories tall. So, this is... I feel like there are two directions that you can take that intro. And I went in the other direction. Which In which way? Because I feel like you can get that intro and be like, oh, they're doing something cool and subtle and different and huh... Oh, or you can take it as, oh, wow, they're being, they're just like, let's do fighting Nazis with a bunch of other stuff to make it even more badass. And it's totally anachronistic, but nobody cares. So, and I, I, that's where I went with it. I like, did my yeah, first okay. time as well. I absolutely was like, I was playing this game because I had heard a lot of people say it was good. I was pretty checked out at the first, uh, couple of stages 
like the the the, the two stages in the past. Where's and... Mecha Hitler? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, I, I don't care about this. Yeah, because like, that was really my that was my assumption at for you know for the first stage was okay. This is they decided to give us a version of the Nazis that would logically have Mecha Hitler. <laughs> yeah. Um. And then at the end of the second stage, where you are, you have stormed into Death's Head Castle, uh, and have managed to get yourselves uh, trapped in there. The, like, Death's Head, the head researcher or something, I don't actually know what his official title is, comes in and captures everyone and forces you to make a choice between uh, killing one of your two companions at this it point. Is, it is. It manages to be even more stupid than when Bioshock Infinite did the same thing. Yeah. I, I mean, like, okay, so here's my problem with that decision, is I felt like there was only one real choice. Like, there was the character that you didn't care at all about at that point, or at least I didn't, or you had, you know, basically the traditional wisecracking buddy cop movie character. So I absolutely went with the wisecracking buddy cop movie character. Oh, man, I did not. I w- Yeah. My first playthrough, I was absolutely like, nope. Oh, I'm taking Wyatt with me. I like, and it was one of those. Well, uh, it was in my head. It was like, well, Wyatt's younger. He's got a longer life to lead. Uh, and so I, I had them kill uh, Fergus. I was so checked out that I just read a guide. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was just like, oh, which one gives me better? Which one gives me better stuff? Okay, I'm gonna pick the one that gives me better stuff. For me, it was like, I don't know. Like, I mean, at that point, Wyatt is had there the, exhibited. A benefit? Yes, Wyatt is better. Really. Yep. Why? Because the uh, armor upgrades give you a better long-term return than the health upgrades. Oh, okay. Like, I didn't even, like, grok that I was getting some benefit from doing both. One of them, it basically, Wyatt, let, Wyatt let, gives you, like, lock picks that give you access to armor upgrades, and the other guy, whose name I can't remember, Fergus. gives you, Fergus. Fergus, gives you uh, like, some hacker tool that lets you get health upgrades. You can you can or health health higher on keypads. Yeah. Yeah. And occasionally there'll be a shortcut that you can open up using one or the other. That's so it's only available to you like if you freed one of them. Because I, I, I was I, like I, I was like, okay, this is a bullshit choice. I don't want to make this choice. Oh, the game just game overs me if I yes. make this choice. If I don't. I'm like, all right, well that's stupid. I'm basically done with this game. Like that was that was when I walked away from this game for a year. I was like, oh, this is dumb. I mean, maybe I'm just cruel. Like, I had zero problem with this decision. Like, one character was interesting, one wasn't. See, for me, it's like you're setting up... You're setting up a... I guess it's supposed to be, like, an emotional choice or something, but... I mean, I feel like mostly it's just meant to be Death's Head is a total asshole. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't feel like it was ever supposed to be an emotional choice. I felt like it was supposed to be death's head messing with you except that it except that i've had like 20 minutes in the game like i'm not that if i were attached to either of those characters or if there had felt like there was some meaningful anything behind that i i don't know i would have i would have felt like that was more meaningful and more characterful versus just like all right well i'm gonna pick one of these effectively at random well, and, like, I feel like maybe I came at this from a weird place because, like, I had actually played the 2008-2009 game that was the pre- the the prequel to this where you're actually fighting Death's Head. So, like, I already had some serious hatred of Death's Head going into it. Yeah, because having not done that, it's suddenly, oh, hey, here's a new character and we're going to kill off one of the characters that you've just met. With this new character that you've met, and I've only really heard a little bit about. Yeah, I mean, like, largely for me, it was a simple case of, oh, well, this is the character that's been helping me out to this point, and this other one is the one that was largely useless. So I'll go with the one that's been helping me out to this point. Yeah. So, after this, your character gets blown out of that building uh, as he is trying to help the other survivor get out, and gets a chunk of shrapnel into his brain and goes Bro- into yeah broken foot guy i don't know his name uh no no broken foot guy gets killed yeah, yeah oh I, th- gets... I thought he was the one that you were carrying out at the end no you're carrying out 
Wyatt or Fergus. I thought. No, White like no, like Fergus not. is on his own. Like he's he's successfully ambulatory. Like yeah, I think you're carrying out broken foot guy. foot guy. Yeah. By the way. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't show back up. At this point and and at this point of the game, you have you have, as part of the story, been blown up like thirty times. Like it's it's comical how many times you have been you have had otherwise ridiculously fatal things happen to you. As part of the story. Yep. Yeah. Yes. BJ Blazkowicz is a superhero, clearly. Yes. Like, I mean, the game and the game set this sets this up, and then you get blown out a window, and some shrapnel hits you in the head. And this puts you into a asylum for the next fourteen years. Yes. In a catatonic state. At which point you wake up in the sixties, and the war's over. The Nazis won. Well, you 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 wake up when the Nazis come to shut down the asylum and murder the doctor and his wife in front of you and then come for you and that's enough to snap you out of the catatonia if so if i probably would have stopped playing this game if the the sequence in which you are in the asylum was not as well done as it was because i was rolling my eyes so hard at this game at this point Mm -hmm. so i was like what but it goes through a really really well done vignette of you being like aware and able to look around but not actually but like immobile and can't really do anything some days it's christmas some days it's birthdays yeah and you're like and it's neat because you can look around it's kind of fuzzy and like people move at fast speed and like flicker around and change but it's it's the first time that what this game for me it was the first time what that what this game does really well becomes apparent yes yeah, because this is the point, this is basically the point where the game is like, you thought that this was just going to be another run-and-gun, you know, shooter. Maybe there's something more here. Yeah. Maybe yeah, we have some characters to show you. Yeah, this was the point at which I was like, okay, maybe this game, maybe there, maybe there is something to this game that's interesting and redeeming and not just gratuitous gore. Which this game absolutely has a lot of gratuitous gore. Yes. And if you play the game like I did, you saw lots of it. But you could totally not play that way if you really wanted to. And what do you mean? Like, you could just kind of stealth around and, like, sur- surgically take people out with throwing knives. You seem to think that that is not actually gory. I was about to say. It is less significantly gory. more gory. Uh, no, I mean, like, I feel like it's it's less, less gory than watching things erupt in a... Uh, spray of chunks when you shotgun them at close range i guess you could shotgun things i feel like like okay so that is interesting gory like they have done a lot of work on a lot of different animations for ways that you can stab someone to death yeah yes Yes. pretty you you yeah this game is this game is up there this game is up there with bioshock infinite for like over the top horrible ways to kill people and a lot of those animations involve the guy you are stabbing looking directly into your eyes with a look of horror and i am certain that this is very very intentional it's one of those things where they're they do a bunch of this stuff for for shock value but i don't feel i feel like it rides this line between we're really gory to drive. We're we're really gory and violent in the way that um, oh, what's this called? Spec Ops: The Line is mm-hmm. versus we're Doom, mm-hmm. and it's this is going to be a continuing theme as we talk about this. But I feel like this it rides the line between making a statement and gratuity, and it sits on both sides of that line a lot. Like yep, it waffles yep. in yes. between, and so it 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 rides the line between like oh that's tasteless and oh that's kind of clever. I mean, I feel like it's trying to appeal to a couple different audiences by doing so, and by also presenting multiple kind a... of paths through the game. I I feel like this game is not this game is not holding back at all. It is trying a lot of interesting things. And it's trying to execute them well, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Yes. Yeah. Case in point, the guns. Okay. 
The guns in this game feel bad. Really? Oh, yeah. I, I love these guns. They feel bloaty. They feel like they have no weight to them. I'm trying to figure out uh, what what I would be looking for. What, what I should be looking for to define that. So there's a couple of things that there's a couple of things for me that that really hurt the the gunplay experience um and it's it's not every gun but it is most notable for any kind of automatic weapon um the shotgun is not this way the pistol is not this way but the pistol is only not that way when it's silenced but the sound levels on most of the guns are not balanced to the rest of what's going on and so they feel very like they feel like pop guns and there's virtually no recoil or some guns have a ton of recoil but do almost no damage and other guns have almost no recoil and deal a ton of damage and i feel like they're doing that to drive home the the nazis have better technology than you point but it mostly just makes those guns feel bad like either either powerful in the same way that uh if you like playing the original Wolfenstein or playing Doom, none of those guns feel good either because it's just like blap 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 blap. There's no yeah, there's yeah. no weight to them. Like you just point you point your cursor at a thing and press the button and it goes blap 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 until things die. Uh, and I felt that way really strongly with most of the guns uh, in this game. Versus, uh, and I'm going to shock a couple of people with the comparison I'm about to make. Versus the guns in Destiny, yeah, where yeah. Each gun in Destiny, when you fire a shot, has the right amount of recoil, the right amount of sound, the right kind of impact and impact reactions on the targets you hit, a good sense of where your bullets are going. And and for most of the guns, like there were many, many times where I pointed the gun at where I pointed the gun at something, fired it, and the bullets went nowhere close to where I was expecting. I have that happen a lot with the uh, the automatic yeah. offerings, and, and it's very much it's very much an automatics problem. Yeah, well, I, I guess for me, like I wasn't expecting Destiny, <laughs> but they were some of the coolest looking guns I've ever seen. They do look really cool. Like I, the I, the '60s Nazi tech guns do look really cool. Yeah, I, especially when the marksman rifle opens up to be the laser cannon. Yeah, the I, marksman rifle becomes amazing. <laughs> Also, once you have upgraded it enough, your laser rifle is awesome. It's it's the railgun you've always wanted. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, yeah, yeah. and some of those are some of those were good. I never felt like I the the laser version of the marksman rifle was pretty good. Um, but, but you I don't get that until you go to the moon. Well, you don't get that until way later, and you lose the scope, which annoys yeah, yeah. me. And and it's like, all right, well, but I I the scope is the reason I liked the marksman rifle. I did like that every single gun had two modes to it. I didn't feel like most of them were usable that way. Like the marksman rifle was, it was bullets until, it was bullets and then it switched modes to lasers, but you could never have, once it switched modes to lasers, like you didn't really have ammo for it. And the pistol was kind of garbage unless you put a silencer on it, in which case it was the mode you wanted to use. Yes. The rockets on the, uh, assault rifle were great and i also i did like the assault rifle especially dual wielding the assault rifle yes which is just silly but i love that yeah i just it felt it felt bad to me and especially like the having to use the two mouse buttons i don't know if it the dual wielding dual wielding guns was the thing that i thought was going to be really cool and the only one that i liked was dual wielding the auto shotguns Dual wielding auto shotguns is very effective at like, taking yeah. down some really hard targets. Yeah, and and I mostly use it for that that thing explicitly. But like after trying a couple of times to dual wield the rifles, I just stopped because it didn't feel good. I mostly only use dual wielding rifles on big targets. Oh, I didn't even use them for that. Big targets. Oh, so you tend to use them for like the big stompy guys with the uh, yeah. Chain yeah. Guns. Yeah, I used I used the mounted the like mounted weapons. Oh yeah, um, that was and that was a, that was another thing that made the guns not feel great to me. There were there they it would they would drop enemies on you that was like you must use this gun against this enemy or you're going to be horrifically ineffective. 
A lot of those things had like weak points too. But most of the guns did not shoot accurately enough for you to exploit those weak points while they were moving. Yeah, that that was definitely a problem that I ran into with the the armored Nazis with the shotguns in particular. Yeah, it's like the armored Nazis with the shotguns, they have a I think they have a small weak point on the back of their head. They they, well, they have the they have a backpack is what it is that they're oh, like will explode, explode if you hit it. Yeah, but they face you because they always know where you are. And the backpack it it, it you can see it over their shoulder, so if you can hit it if you can shoot just right, you can hit it, but it's a very small target. It's a really small target, and you mostly don't have... Your weapons are not accurate enough, for the most part, to hit those hit those things. I was very happy when I had upgraded the laser craft work to the point where it had a scope and could basically just one-shot one of those guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, the, and the, laser was, the laser was cool. Like, it never... You never had enough ammo for it, but... Like, you never really had enough ammo to do, like, an, any kind of extended firefight with it, but it it definitely but until it fell down, down, it hit better. like a truck. Yeah, I mean, it hit really good. It, it hit really, really well. Um, but yeah, like, as as an example of sometimes it, this game does the thing really, really well, and sometimes it doesn't, like, the guns are super hit or miss, and a lot of them are big misses. So we had a conversation about this, and you said none of the guns feel good, but combat does. Yes. So I, I kind of want to dig into this because I have some thoughts on why that might be, but I'm wondering what yours are. So what this, what the combat, the combat is really interesting because they present you with a bunch of different ways to approach it, not very many wrong answers, and lots of different, um, lots of different tools, whether or not you like them, lots of different tools to approach the combat in the game. And in a in a similar vein, the enemies that you fight have are interestingly varied, with the exception of like your basic Nazi trooper. Mm-hmm. And and those guys are those guys are interesting to fight because you can win really easily. Um, but but there's a bunch, but there's a lot of them, and so it's an it's an enemy that they can throw a lot of them at you and make you feel powerful without just mowing down lots and lots of these dudes. Um, I also think that the progression system that rewards you for fighting enemies in certain ways, while it is very badly messaged, makes combat interesting because it kind of keeps it fresh. Um, I and and as a as a third point, I think that the um, I think that the level design the level design is not winning any prizes for the most part, but it does it does some it does interesting things with the enemies you're fighting. So that it's not just like, it's neither just a corridor shooter, nor are you put in situations where the combat, the combat of the game matches the level design very, very well. Yeah. I found the ability to basically destroy every piece of terrain in some way actually pretty interesting. Just because it it means that as combat progresses, your cover options become much more limited and you have to change your tactics on as the situation changes. Well, and there were a couple of moments where you knew you were about to get flooded with troops. So like you could try and do some stuff to minimize their cover options. I'm namely thinking of uh, the, the prison break in slash break out. There's a scene. Yeah. There's a scene where you've got like this mech for a limited period of time and you're just about to get fired upon, but you can do some stuff during that time to really reduce the amount of things that the enemies can hide behind. Okay, the second prison, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the second okay. prison. Basiris or whatever. Bellica? B word. Yeah, Bellica. that word. Yeah. Yeah, Bellic is not a prison. It's a camp. Different. Arguably worse. I made cheat sheets for character names, not for location names. <laughs> I like they I felt like they did a good job of having a new enemy type show up and show up in a way that it's this like a, a, like effectively the boss of that level. Like I'm particularly thinking um, when you're going through the wall in the with the the grandparents, mm-hmm. and you have to fight your way through, and then at the very end, the giant Nazi robots are unleashed. Yep, and you know they're a whole big deal, and they never cease to be a big deal, but 
you know, you, you run into those things again later on and have more tools available and, you know, are much more able to take them down, you know, more easily. I mean, yeah. to be honest, like that, that's exactly like the original Wolfenstein 3D. Like in the, yeah. in the first level of Wolfenstein 3D, the end boss is the blue uh, chain gun guy. And then, you know, very quickly you start seeing them all over the freaking place. And that's just a normal mob. But yeah, I felt like they did a good job of giving you, of giving you tool new tools spaced out over the course of the game and ramping up enemy difficulty to match so that you never I never felt completely overwhelmed. Um, I think with I rare think exception. My, my least favorite level was uh the uh once you return from the moon because that is the first level after they have introduced all of their weapons. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's nothing new for them to give you at that point. Yeah. And at that point, it just becomes a lot of dudes for you to clear through with the same suite of weapons that you've been using. That was, that was the only point at which it really started to feel repetitive because you just went through wave after wave after wave of soldiers which when you're storming, I think, Death's, Death's Head's head, compound. storming the compound the second time. Yeah. Right? Well, not that one. So, uh, the London Nautica, the Return of the London Nautica, when you re when you, when you re-enter from the moon. Yeah, you come back from the moon and you end up having to make your way down through the building. Death's Head Compound is actually kind of interesting in that it is just three big fights. It's just three big rooms of guys. Yeah. Yeah, but that it's one actually... room that's got like all the statues in it, that one is yes. just sem- seemed to go on forever. Yes, that's because it's that's it's designed to be a big difficult set piece battle, and they do a good job with it. Which which one? The final one before you uh, get to fight Death's Head. Oh, I don't feel like I remember that. Yeah. Um, where was that? It was um, it was in his base. It was the big giant room that had a couple of statues and like three of the heavily armored troopers that you had to fight through and there were like two gun emplacement turrets and it's basically uh, once you, once you once you come up from the sewer or the the docks or whatever right 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 uh so i i kind of want to talk about we talked about these earlier but the recordings that anya sends you about the journal the journal, Romana's journal, uh, Ramona's journal. Yeah. When, like that was, I, I kind of wish they had executed those better. Like I kind of wish they had her redo portions of those throughout the, uh, levels, but because it's easy to miss them, but boy, do those shed a different light on that character. Yup. Yeah. Her sister, you mean? Well, spoilers that wasn't about her sister yeah yeah i know yeah Yeah. it's yeah so yeah you've got the character who you've it's it's interesting man so this game does a lot of downtime between these big fighty missions and like bj kind of lampshades it at near the end where he's like what am i everyone's aaron's boy but you really like when you aren't out there being an unstoppable uh unstoppable killer killing machine you don't really have a role you don't have a role you're just everyone's gopher everyone who is doing something important in the base yep so you you just sort of wander around and find stuff but uh anya immediately gets a role because she's very educated and she she was a doctorate student (laughs) Yeah, she, she can type. She knows mathematics. She's yeah, and so she becomes the communications officer for the organization. And you find out that she's been a serial killer for the past fifteen years since like since she was a kid since nineteen forty. Yeah, and. And the game's taking place in sitting in nineteen sixty. So just just killing Nazis. It does help explain why she was so you know, why she fell into the role so easily of assisting you with all of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because that does seem that does seem odd, you know, when at that point in the game when you you know, 
because you re you rescue her after the Nazis have you know broken into the asylum and you, you drive off with her and like you end up killing some more Nazis on the road and she's not not phased that. yeah she's not phased by it <laughs> this game does so there was there was a uh, an extra credits that was talking about in defensive cutscene recently. And basically the argument was that cutscenes used to be used to show all of this awesome over-the-top action sequences, and those weren't satisfying because largely they led to players wanting to be involved in those over-the-top action sequences. But using cutscenes to show, like, personal moments or quieter moments is really effective, and I think this game does a very good job at using both cutscenes for that and also using these sort of interactive scenes that yes. are deliberately paced in interesting ways like there is a scene where you are interrogating a nazi to try and find out where the resistance people are and like he is like laughing at you at the beginning and talk talking about how like and all you are supposed to do is quietly walk around the room like looking for various items and so you're walking around slowly getting all of the items together so that you could basically start threatening him with a chainsaw but every time you pick up an item he there's another line of dialogue as he starts to become really unhinged and it really is a effective at sort of co conveying the like horror of watching somebody like stalking around looking at all of these implements with which to like torture a guy yeah, yeah also you... go ahead it it and it works really well it i think also at really getting across that vj is like he's just going to do what he needs to do and he's this implacable killing machine and Would... like that's I, that's i think the first the first scene that really gets that across outside of a combat situation well and, and like early on he's talking about like he doesn't know if any any of the resistance still is alive but either way he's going to fight it solo if he has to like there's there he's not going to not do this thing this game like sounds horrifying and it like <laughs> It is, but this is a game that presents you a world in which once you've interacted with it, you want to make this a post-apocalypse world. Because all I want to do is destroy this world. I yeah. want to be the agent of destruction because this it's world is wrong. I, I don't have that reaction. It's, I guess for me, it's like everything about this world is a perversion of like everything that is good and right and and i want to make it burn well they've, they've definitely built a world that at least the parts of it that you see predominantly seem like there's nothing worth saving with some rare exceptions like there are some moments there there are some moments where you like overhear civilians talking one or two where you know it's like they're they're doing something relatively normal but even then there's the whole you know that you know, we should go on vacation to, you know, and my brother tells me that, you know, they're re they're building this beautiful new city to rebuild Beijing after it was destroyed, you know, and things like that. So even there, I'm, I would really like to see a sequel to this game that goes to somewhere other than Europe and not the U.S. to see more of this world maybe outside of the area that was held by the Nazis during this game. Honestly, what I what I would really like to see, I would like a sequel where you play Bombot and he returns to Africa to rejoin the fight there. Yeah, that would be cool. Because just what little of, you know, the few scenes that he shows up in, I love that character. Oh, that character is great. great. I want, yeah, I would have, I kind of wanted more of that guy. And it's <laughs> frustrating that I, that there wasn't that there. I mean, I have a theory about who the main character of the next game is going to be, given that it is currently subtitled New Colossus. And that is the poem that BJ reads about Anya right before the end of the game. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my 
I I would love to see I would love to see Bombot as the main character, but mm-hmm. my expectation is the more likely is either a game that would probably feel pretty differently with Anya as the main character or BJ Jr. That seems the most obvious and maybe the least likely because I, I feel like, feel like it's, it's too, too obvious. obvious. I don't think Bethesda has rights to Commander Keen. I'm pretty sure they do. Command, Commander Keen is the grandson of BJ. Yes. Oh. And I would, and I would also have... I would also pay good money for a sequel to this game set in the set in the modern day that deals with what happens when they finally have taken down the Nazis completely and are starting to rebuild the world and then the goddamn aliens invade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only into it if they're if they're the aliens from uh, Aliens Ate My Babysitter. I was about to say, <laughs> I I have to point out none of the aliens in Commander Keen invade or do anything wrong for any reason other than the fact that the bratty neighborhood kid gets them to do it. It's true. <laughs> but yes, please more Commander Keen games. I mean, I would play a I would play a sequel to this that's set fifty years later, where like it's now a real war again, but it's still but like the not but you're still like fighting the Nazis, and you as Commander Keen go and get alien help. Yes, that'd be like, cool too. That would be a sweet game. I'd play that game. I think the thing that I like the most about this game is it's this weird fusion of The Great Escape and a heist movie. What like? Like this, this game as a whole to me is this fusion of the Great Escape, the movie, and a heist film. So it's interesting you mentioned film, because for me this game is a Quentin Tarantino movie made into a video game. I, mm. I mean, I definitely feel like this movie lives in the same general area as Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. Well, well... Yeah. I... I don't feel like it I feel like it has these these moments of really brilliant storytelling, but the overall storytelling is like C plus B minus. Really? Because it's got some really great moments. Yeah, there are there are a few moments that like definitely, you know, caused my heart to swell or me to choke up. Yeah. Like it has it has some really, really great moments. But I have big issues with the overall arc of the game okay what are those uh well starting with i mean we can crack the the horrifically racist part like judaism ex machina so yeah there like, is the arc of this game is the nazis stole all of their technology from from a jewish secret society from a jewish secret society that has its fingers everywhere in the globe and secret hideouts and wealth beyond imagining every like yeah yeah it the most stereotypical like con- jewish conspiracy theory imaginable is literally completely in the game with not even a little bit of anything to ameliorate it it's yeah, like yeah. and and it's not even ignorable because it is literally the crucial part of the game. Like it is, it is literally the thing that you have to interact with for this for the story to move forward. Yep, like yep. it's literally impossible to to avoid or write off because it is the core conceit of the game. Yeah, and I and I get what they were going for. That you know the basically the Nazis were only able to win the war by relying on technology from created by the very people whom they you know claimed to be subhuman but yeah it's super tone deaf yes but... it, it, this was this this was another extra credits that i thought of while i was playing this game which is lazy game design and in that episode they're talking about call of juarez and the way that they are portraying the human trafficking problem in the completely opposite way of how it actually happened. Yeah. And I feel like this is some, like, somebody thought this was a good idea, and they didn't get the outside input needed for them to realize it was a bad idea. Yeah. Because I can see the thought process, which is, hey, like, wouldn't it be awesome if we made, like, a, a Jewish person a, one of the heroes in this game? And they're like, okay, like, why, why, don't we make, why don't we make all of the Jewish people, like, 
actually way smarter than ever. And they they just they were trying to make it empowering, and instead they made it incredibly racist. Yeah, and yeah. and because I mean, I honestly, I honestly like Seth Roth, the 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 Jewish character in question. Sure, like, I like him, but boy, is he super stereotypically Jewish. Yes, yes. And it was like at first, it was like okay, I I get it, but it's but it's also like, huh, you're you're being billed to me as the great inventor who has access to some secrets. I see where this is going, and oh, it went exactly, it went exactly, it went exactly there in the worst place, in the worst way possible, down to secret gold and jewels and riches in these like. Duh. I yeah. okay, so I didn't get like the whole jewel like jewels and riches. Those were always supposed to just be places for research to be stored. Except they're they're literally oh, not gold. because when you actually go in one, there's gold everywhere. Huh. I mean Every, a lot of the stuff is built out of gold. It's like not it's only just, is yeah. everything gold plated, there's like seven gold pickups. It's the most gold dense part of the entire game. Yeah. It tremendously unsubtle. And and it and yeah it and unfortunately it's like I said it's from a from an overall story perspective it's inescapable because it is literally the only reason you can put up a reasonable fight against the Nazi regime. Yep. And so while, while I say that the game has some really some really great it has some really great moments, the overall story arc really sits wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially because that whole thing is set up. It's not. It isn't. It's like that, and then also this super Deus Ex Machina out of nowhere, way better technology. Well, I mean, it's it's ultimately not that technology that ends up destroying the compound. It's actually just the German nukes. But the nukes were were from that technology. Oh, okay. That was part of what yeah, the Germans sure. stole. I mean, the implication is that. In our world, in the real world, the Germans did not gain access to – they, they weren't able to find one of these secret caches of technology, but the secret society, the Daiki Shud, shared some of the technology with the Allies. Uh, like okay. While you're walking into – the one that Setroth takes you to, he's talking about how, you know, we, you know, we, we had started, we had seen how things were going and we had started sharing, you know, bits of the technology, but it was too late. Yeah. So the implication is that nuclear power was one of the things that they had, you know, come up with who knows how long ago and that, you know, yeah, that, that was where that originated. Yeah. On the bright side, Nazi moon base. <laughs> Everything is made better by a Nazi moon base. I really did enjoy the Nazi moon base thing. I think that's a required like trope when you get into World War II science fiction or you know, is Nazis, Nazis end up on the moon. History sci fi, yeah. Nazis yeah, like, always end up on the moon. Like Iron Sky, the movie. Yep. So a lot of what was also going on in this game was pretty unsubtly like suppo- it was it was Nazis doing all of these things America did. Yeah. And, like, some of it is just literally what America did, but you feel uncomfortable. Like, you... you, This game does a pretty good job at skewering some of the worst excesses of, like, America while it's been the superpower of the world. Because it, it presents you all of these things that America did, only what if it was done by Nazis? And it's it's really awful feeling. Like, because it's awful what we did, and it's just, it's one of those things where it's doing a good job reflecting some things. Yeah, like making you think, okay, why 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 is this bad now? But, you know, when we did it, it wasn't bad yeah. for some reason. I well, wish that it. I wish that it did that better. I wish that it was because I, I feel like that's layers of subtlety deep before you get there. Yeah, you do have to kind of look for it. Like if you squint a little, you could kind of see it. See, and, I guess. I guess the thing is, is like this goes back to my statement that this game is trying to be multiple things to multiple different audiences. 
Yeah. Like it's trying to be this fun action y romp for the people that just wanted, you know, a logical successor to the Wolfenstein franchise. Yeah, who just want to shoot Nazis. Yeah. And I think like if that's literally all you want and the game tries to to put these messages out there too heavy handedly, then folks are just gonna check out. Because like most of the really interesting character building is optional. Like yeah. you don't have to go find Max's toys. Or you don't have to go find uh, the 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 lady from the the prison camp's ring. Um, you don't have to find these things that, that give you little vignettes when you get back to base. But but you totally can, and and it's more interesting because you can. Speaking of little vignettes, I do think the way Jay goes out is one of my favorite scenes. It is pretty great. And also why I think that the Wyatt timeline is better than the Fergus timeline, Bell. Nope, 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 nope. Tekla is way cooler. Than Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, yes, I mean, yes. You, you, can have, you can have woman loosely based on Tesla, or you can have actual literal Jimi Hendrix. I have to go with actual literal Jimi Hendrix. Who yeah, has, no. Who has spent like 10 years hiding amps around Berlin... So that he can play uh, the Star Spangled Banner throughout the entire city on electric guitar. That was awesome. I don't know. I, I just, I, I've played both. And I just liked Tekla better than I liked Jimi Hendrix. I think this was a this was another game that used music really, really well. Yes. The soundtrack is amazing. Yeah. Because, I mean, in addition to, we already talked about the story. The odd, you know, recognizable Germanic versions of songs, but there's also just the soundtrack overall, and it is fantastic. Uh, I mean, when this first came out, like I listened to it at work a lot in the background. I'm glad I didn't do that because that would have probably caused me to try and figure out where I believe is from. And And when that song started rolling, oh, those feels, those feels. This is one of those games where, like, I absolutely knew going into it there wouldn't be a happy ending, but man, I wanted there to be a happy ending. It, in fact, says right in the opening cutscene. Yep. 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 Like, I knew this that was where it was going, but man, did I really want that not to be the case. I didn't recognize that in the first playthrough of it, but yeah, in the second playthrough, I was like, oh yeah, yep, I guess, I guess that's, that's a thing that was said. I really liked the relationship between BJ and Anya. I feel like I wanted more of that. It's, yeah, I would have. It was a really, like really the, great start. It, it, it definitely felt. It felt like one of the more realistic relationships I've seen in video games. I mean, it was definitely two broken people clinging to each other in a bad situation. Yeah, I, I'm, I really don't like BJ as a character. Like, not, not like. I don't like him as a person, but I feel like as a character, he's really, really flat. And because oh. he's literally, he literally talks in this gravelly monotone through the whole thing and has no emotional anything at any point in the game. Uh, like, like <laughs> except possibly anger. Man, so I have to feel like, okay, this is probably zero shock here, but like, BJ is kind of my ideal character for any game. Uh, it Because it's... you can layer yourself on top of him. Yeah, like, yes. he's this blank slate, but he's not supposed to be in the game. See, that's interesting, because he isn't really a blank slate. There's no, a... and, that, and that's I... what bothers me, is that he isn't a blank slate. He's just so flat that you can overlay whatever you want on top of it because there's not really anything there. But he's not he's, supposed he's, to be a blank slate. He's actually a lot more intelligent than I realized. Yeah, he's like a reasonably intelligent... Like, he's reasonably intelligent and... He's capable of speaking, like, four different languages. Sure. Yeah. But, like, but everything about his character reads like a checklist off of a character sheet, not a personality. I feel like he has one very big defining personality trait, which is he hates Nazis. Like, like, but, but that's not yeah. a personality trait. It almost becomes one with him. I, I can't agree. Like, it's an obsession. It, yeah, like it's it's that scene where, like, as soon as he meets Klaus, without even thinking, he like 
traps him against a table and is about to like start stabbing him because he sees a Nazi tattoo, even though he's like in an obvious safe house. Right. I mean, that just, that just, it, it makes me think he's dumb. See, I don't get that at all. Like he is, or has he has no been, control. he has been trained to do one thing. Like, and he's been doing this like forever. I guess that's the thing though. He's a soldier. Soldiers are disciplined. He's not. He's a bad soldier. Like, that's the thing that bugs me, is that he's supposed to be a soldier. And the parts of his, the, 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 the like, little bits of personality that peek through undermine what he's supposed to be. He's trained to fight a war. He's not trained to brutally murder as many people as possible. He does this, but... I feel like this is another case where they didn't want to... They didn't want to like directly contradict the established characterization of BJ, which I mean comes from Wolfenstein 3D and is basically, you know, blank slate who murders a bunch of Nazis. Yeah. But and they do. They but they... So they don't contradict it, but I mean they, they add like there are places where you see glimmers of more peeking through. And I feel like their intention was there's these there are these there's more to him under the surface, but he keeps it all very tightly bottled up. But they, maybe they, yeah. they didn't, maybe they went too far with him keeping it bottled up. That maybe he, sh if he had shown a little more of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's no payoff. There's, you've got this character that either has no personality or is bottling their emotions up super, super, super ultra hard. But if it's the latter, that's potentially interesting, but there's no payoff. He's literally like flat, monotone, well, I guess I'm dying, up until the credits literally roll. And so you never get an emotional payoff at any point. I mean, even even when he's narrating his relationship with Anya, it's this like dead tone. I don't know. Like, I, I just kind of read him as a, a broken person. I mean, there's yeah. that too. too. I mean, I mean suffering severe brain damage. What could yeah, that like, have done? There's, it's def he's definitely, he's definitely that. And I think that, and I think that that's an interesting, I feel like that's an interesting character, but it never, it never materializes in any, in any way, the way it does with, um, um, uh, what's her name? The commander of the cell. Carolyn. 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 Yeah. The way it does with, Carolyn has this really great payoff. Yes. Like yes. The, her, she does the same thing as BJ, where she's very like stern and serious but like you get to see her open up and it's really satisfying and really great yeah one of my absolute favorite moments the entire game one of the one of the moments that made my you know that really tugged at my heart and made me choke up is when you've broken into the london nautica to steal the helicopters and they hang glide in to come to get the helicopters and caroline you know can't walk so you have to go you know, pick her up and carry her to the helicopter and then you get in and you're talking with her about how, you know, she lost her legs and everything. And, and she says, now I can fly. Yeah. yeah like, like I may not be able to walk, but I learned how to fly. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, that's an incredibly great moment like that. And, and, and there's a, the scene later when she gets the like mecha suit or whatever, yeah, and and it totally changes how she moves, but you can, but it works so well for her, and like that, that's the kind of payoff that I really, I, I think is really great because she's so stern and snappy, but like has these moments that are great, and and you see, and and you see it with Anya when she starts doing the, uh, when she starts clicking into the 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 typing. And you realize, like, no, she's really, really smart and is really good at things. Like, she's super great at this. Um, and and her reading the the journal and like I, those are really cool. And I didn't get that out of BJ. I think I liked this game as a fitting end to BJ Blazkowicz. I hope they don't make another game with him again. Well, they already have. Well, I, not a, oh, oh, they made the prequel. Was, yeah, they they made the prequel, like, so like they they technically have. I I hope they carry the story forward. Like 
we were talking earlier, I hope they carry the story forward with one of the other interesting characters from this game as the main character. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and I'm and I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that the villain of the next game is going to be Frau Angle. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think. Wasn't she the villain of the prequel? What was, was she? I, also, I thought she died. No, she nope. Didn't. Oh, no, she right. didn't. She's on the Dang. screen. She's just mad. Yeah, like she survived. I thought she died. I thought she died in the nuke. No, nope. Because she's she? not. She's she not was at London Nautica. Yeah, yeah, she wasn't there. Oh, I thought she was in that. She was, I thought she was coordinating the defense of the tower. No, no she was dealing with the London Nautica. She was. Oh. Booby was there, and so she saw you kill Booby. Yeah, but yeah, no, she got away. She's still out there, horribly disfigured, and furious. Salty. Ultra salty. She's basically going to be the new Death's Head. Yeah, that's... Yeah. So Death's Head. I never played any of these games or to this one. Who's so Death's Head? Death's Head is just this evil scientist, basically. Like, Death's Head exists only so that they could have a main villain that wasn't Adolf Hitler, or one of the other cronies of Adolf Hitler... And therefore, it could sell in Germany. Yeah, they wanted someone who wasn't an actual historical German. Do they even give him a name? Uh, Wilhelm Strasse. Yeah. yeah, but he's yeah he was in both the weird he was he was in the game that would had all the weird um, supernatural garbage, and then also the one after that that was also the one that Caroline appeared in before. So Caroline has appeared in a game yeah. before. I was wondering yeah. about that. Yeah, she was the basically his handler in the 2009 Wolfenstein game. And she got shot through the spine by Death's Head's bodyguard. So in truth, those two games blend pretty well together. It's just, I mean, nobody played that other game. <laughs> I did, because I've always been a Wolfenstein fan. Um, and I loved Return to Wol Castle Wolfenstein. It's one of the few games I, I played competitively. So I that's this is interesting to me because like I am this is my first entry into the Wolfenstein games since Wolfenstein 3D. But no, I'm I'm really excited to see where they they are going from here. So I I wanted to have this conversation because this is this struck me as weird when I first saw it. The way this game it has it has two sex scenes in it and one is uh shot in what i would typically consider like the mass effect like way of shooting a sex scene and one is shot very like awkwardly what like, one is a bathroom quickie yeah yeah which i don't see portrayed in like most media like i i cannot remember a time when i've seen any sort of sex scene where the guy has tidy whities loosely hanging around his ankles <laughs> and it's just really no i can't i cannot say i have seen that maybe i'm not watching enough movies it's just, oh i was it, thinking i've seen it in, i've seen it in movies and video games interesting it's a it's a really i mean that kind of thing is a is a pretty common like deglorification of sex media trick i mean yeah it definitely does that in that scene? Yeah, it's a it's a thing that they do a lot. That is done a lot. Yeah, I guess I that this is the first time I've encountered it. Which it like again, it's it's definitely sort of showing sex as a thing that happens and is really awkward when you don't have any privacy. <laughs> yeah, when someone's banging on the door telling you to yeah. hurry it up because we got work to do. This game approaches a lot of adult material. Like, it also touches on the co topic of abortion, like, briefly, but that was yeah, also diaries. something I don't often see brought up in games. It's just, it was, it's jarring for me to see this content subject matter that I don't often see in this medium. Yeah, it's a thing that I, I'm used to, just different media consumption um but yeah it's it's you see it a lot more in in international media i think i mean this game was made by a swedish development team yeah, yeah. that's why well, it, it's why i say it's a thing that you see a lot more in like 
especially European media, but also elsewhere. It makes me realize that I want more games from more international games. Right? Yeah, I mean... Definitely. If you've ever wondered why I, uh, why I like, ravenously consume media outside of the States, it's because there's so much... There's some really interesting, like, viewpoints that... And, and takes that don't get... Um, you, you start to realize, like, what the rest of the world is doing. Mm-hmm. Lastly, I kind of want to say, when I heard that they were making a new Wolfenstein, the thing that I thought of was the fact that they recent, at, recently to that point, a new Duke Nukem game had just came out. Oh, God. Wow. Wow. wow is it, wow is it possible to refresh old IP? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and and like there's a lot of things about this game that I'm really down on, but I think that it is a vastly better reboot than the other similar era reboots I've seen. Like, I mean, the main other one I had played was uh, Doom Three. It was not all that old by this point, and it was okay. Yeah, I feel like at the time it came out. Better. At the time it came out, Doom 3 felt really awesome. Like, I loved that game. That was the flashlight one, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the one that everybody complained because you couldn't tape a flashlight to your gun. Oh, sure you could. If you're playing on PC, there were tons of mods that would give you that ability, and I and I absolutely attached flashlights to my guns. Yeah. I don't know if I count modding in that particular case. I think the main difference is I had played System Shock 2, Right. And so and, Doom 3 didn't feel like it was doing anything new. Yes. I had a similar whereas, feel. Yeah. Whereas this felt like they were actually trying something new and different. Yeah, I had I, never played a System Shock game. I, I still like, haven't today. <laughs> I feel like the the thing that the, the thing that was really I and mean, we've sort of touched on this, but like the destroy everything and like using the laser to cut your way through levels and making you think about how about traversal differently because of that, I think was a was a truly fantastic piece of this mm -hmm. that I've only ever seen in like one or two other games that are not as polished as this. like the Red Faction series makes its name on that, but is not otherwise doing anything particularly interesting. Yeah. Whereas this is, you know, it tell it tells a story well enough that I can get angry at it. And it's got some legitimately really great storytelling moments in 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 amongst everything that's going on like it can improve but i also feel like i i want more of these because i feel like there's some really interesting hey here's how you get around a level things that they could do with it and like if you give me if you had if you gave me like a jet pack if you have me like flying around buildings blowing holes in them with a like a rocket launcher so i can go in and fly in there with my jet pack and shoot nazis like that's that's something that you don't get in very many other games, and it would totally fit here. Or, like, I'm going to jetpack up the side of a building and then cut my way into it? Yeah. Like, that would be neat. Well, like, my favorite sequence in the game was the rappelling up the side of a building. <laughs> rappelling in reverse. Um, and, you like, that never actually got a, a revisit, and I think it would have been cool. Yeah. I mean, basically, it's a slow corridor shooter. It's like a sh slow shooting gallery corridor shooter, but man, that presentation is great. Yeah, it yeah. felt great. Like, it felt really cool to be, you know, sure enough, yeah, absolutely people would be poking their heads out windows to attack you. Like, that makes total sense. Yeah. I don't know. For me, like, I would rank this game among some of my favorite games because, like, it, it did everything I possibly wanted it to do and more. Like, I, I wasn't expecting, you know the the most innovative game out there i was expecting like a fitting successor to the wolfenstein franchise and like wolfenstein is a key franchise for me in that wolfenstein 3d was the game that made me a pc gamer yeah like absolutely that was the game that was like holy shit pc gaming is awesome like this is so much cooler than anything i can do on my super nintendo i want to be a pc gamer now Wolfenstein 3D was the game that got me to buy a sound card. Yeah, yeah, like I didn't even I didn't even have a sound card. Like we we couldn't add one to our computer. So I had like this Disney sound something 
oh, device okay. that you plugged in through the the parallel port. Mm-hmm. Yep, I remember those. Yeah, but I absolutely bought one of those so that I could have sound while playing Wolfenstein. And like, um, at lunch, we like it was a, a daily thing that we would sit there and build levels in a Wolfenstein editor we found, and then like have each other play those levels. So the whole you know excite bite thing. So Wolfenstein is a really key game for me. Like it, it was an important game. So going into this, like I, I had a, like a lot of emotional baggage and it, it paid off in spades. Like it, it gave me a new Wolfenstein adventure that felt very Wolfenstein, but also gave me a lot more. Like it gave me an interesting setting. It gave me a whole list of interesting characters. So, I mean, while it is obviously not a perfect game, like it is, I would consider it a perfect game for what I was expecting it to be. Yeah, this is the first Wolfenstein that I played more than thirty seconds of. This this game does have more world building than most shooters I've ever played. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, it, it it left me wanting to know more about the world outside of you know Germany and London that we saw. Like I would play any number of vignette spinoff games that they come up with that let me play with various characters. Like if they had just released a sequence of games that were prequels of what these characters did before they ended up in Wolfenstein enemy territory, where I got to see other corners of the world, I would absolutely pay for every single one that came out. I mean, and honestly, like I liked old blood. I thought it was a good game. Um, it. it, It is the most true to Wolfenstein game because you're basically escaping from, death's head's compound or actually you're escaping from castle wolfenstein um but like it was good like it was really good it felt interesting you were given a super limited set of tools to work with it forced me to stealth through and i didn't hate it for doing so which in itself is a huge compliment because normally i bounce super hard when a game makes me stealth so it, it's interesting because i come at this from a different angle doom wolfenstein and Quake all kind of feel the same to me. They're completely interchangeable in my head. Oh, wow. No, and not for me. No, I have no attachment to any of them. Um, well, I think part of that's like the decade difference between our ages. It probably is. And like, probably. even the first Dark Forces kind of sits there. Oh my like, god, I love the first Dark Forces so much. It's the only one of them that I've played, and I really enjoyed it, but it doesn't feel appreciably different from or for me it doesn't feel appreciably different from those other games and i guess it's because like at that time what dark forces was doing was so vastly different and cutting edge compared to everything else yeah i have a lot of good memories of duke nukem 3d because that was the game that i learned modding on um and because i was an adolescent and hadn't developed taste yet (laughs) um but yeah, and, and it's it's interesting because I, I came to PC gaming for the stories. And so that's that's what I'm there for. And getting into action games later was, you know, getting into real-time action games that weren't flight sims later was kind of a secondary thing. So, like, I remember playing, I remember, like, playing Wolfenstein at a friend's house. And I'm like, oh, man, you should try this. It's so awesome. You love games. And I tried it, and I was like, well, what's the story? He's like, oh, you're getting out of this castle and shooting all these Nazis. I was like, that's the story? Okay. I absolutely got into PC gaming by riding the wave of incrementally better first-person shooter games. Yeah. <laughs> I, got there, I, got there from, uh, I got there from adventure games into RPGs. Like, straight line from, straight line from adventure game titles to uh, Black Isle isometric uh, thing. Uh, Black Isle isometric games and Warcraft 3. Yeah. Into MMOs. Like, straight line. Yeah, honestly, like, I really didn't get into PC role-playing games until probably Fallout. I mean, I guess it's not that late. But yeah, whereas I, like, my first PC role-playing game was Might and Magic, the first one. I mean, technically I had played, I think, Might and Magic 3. I don't know when that that fits in. Um, But, like, as far as the... Yeah, 91. Yeah, okay, so probably, I mean, that's around the same time as Wolfenstein. So I know I played that, and I played Civilization, and but, like, the thing I was I was super into was first-person shooters and making levels for first-person shooters. Because at that point, I still really preferred, you know, 
JRPGs on, you know, Nintendo platforms. Yeah, and that I came to well after I was playing Black Isle games. Yeah, like I got Final Fantasy 1 for Nintendo the week it came out. I was like super pumped that, that something like that existed. Yeah. Yeah, I picked it up not long after it came out because Nintendo Power made it look so incredibly awesome. Yeah, no, like that article in Nintendo Power is like, I am sold. Where do I throw my money now? Because Mostly because like the Ultima games felt so much lower fidelity than Final Fantasy, for me at least. And I had dabbled in Ultima. And I had also dabbled in like the Gold Box games, but again, they felt really low fidelity. I never played any Ultima. You'd think that I would have. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah. Yeah. You'd think that I would have ever played an Ultima game. Because in particular, Ultima's six and seven are like they are very meaningful games. And I, I feel like that. I feel like that's why I didn't. Because by the time I was gonna play any Ultima games, it was like Ultima five, and I was just like, I don't know this series, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna jump in at five. I don't know this series at all. The one I played the most of was Ultima three. I think it was Ultima three. I had Ultima three on the Nintendo. Yeah, I did too. Like, I played it on the Nintendo. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of people. I mean, I know a ton of people who have, like, all of these formative stories of playing Ultima, and I just never did. And by the time I by the time I did get around to it, I'd seen better stories in other games, and so wasn't impressed. Because I think I played, like, I don't remember. I played some Ultima game, and I don't remember what it was. And it wasn't new when I played it. But I was like, oh, I've seen everything this game is doing already. I'm curious. It was three yeah. yeah. Ultima, oh, it was probably Ultima, Ultima, Ultima Underworld. And it might have been? Yeah, like different subset of game. No, 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 no. Oh, oh wait. Not, okay, 3D as in... As in with a 3D renderer. Oh, Ultima 8. Ultima 8 was garbage. Ultima 8 Pagan? Yes. This does not look like the game I played. No, it wasn't isometric. Yeah, because everything prior to Ultima 8 was... Ultima 9. Uh, Sprite. Ultima uh, 9 is the one that I played. Ultima 9 doesn't exist. Ooh. Well. It's, it's bad. Like, Ultima 8... Ultima yeah, 8 was great. poor, but you can make a case for it. Ultima 9 should never have been made. Well. All right. Well, this explains why I wasn't impressed by Ultima games when I played yeah. them. Yeah. No. Good. If, like, if you, ever, if you ever have the interest to go back and look at it, like, Ultima 6 or Ultima 7 are, like the the high water marks ultima 6 was the first video game that i played where beating a big bad guy was not the correct choice like was not how you win the game it it was very much a game about philosophies and like morality yeah and i'd heard that i'd heard about i'd heard that when i played ultima 9 like that was the thing and then i was yeah no 9 threw all that out the window and was dumb yeah. Plus, it was horribly, horribly buggy when it first came out. Oh yeah. But I didn't care because that was the time. That was those were in the times where I would sit and play. Um, where I would sit and fiddle with a with a game forever to make it work. Speaking of which, going back to the topic, it took me four hours to get Wolfenstein: The New Order to work on my computer. Wow. Wow. It would open up in 640 by 480 resolution and refuse to go any higher. Is it because you have a weird format monitor? I have no idea. I could not figure out what was going on. See, the the funny thing is that you say that. Like, I thought the game actually worked better than most id Bethesda-style games because, like, every one of those games for me has this moment where it launches and it's all jacked up and I have to close it back down and then it launches and it works fine. I never and, had those problems. But and I this one, yeah, this one absolutely, like, it worked perfectly the first moment I, I launched it. I didn't have to go through the weird back and forth to get it working. Because, like, I, I have to do that with every other Bethesda game. Yeah, Wolfenstein did initially open up in completely and utterly the wrong resolution for me but yeah, it, like i was able to fix it just by going into the options i don't I, yeah the options were all grayed out for me and it, it had the thing where it was like oh what monitor do you want to play this on it was like well i guess i could play it on my secondary monitor but nope still 640 by 480 wouldn't change anything uh what i had to do was open it in a window put the window up to the corner 
uh, and a little over the side and then drag the window manually into the right resolution, which, by the way, makes your graphics card real mad at you. <laughs> uh, and and that would lock it to my monitor's resolution. And then I could put it on full screen windowed mode, which would retain that, um, which would retain that, um, what's this called? That resolution. Um, Cause it would, it would, I could then set the, re- I could basically say like, Hey, window be this size manually. And then once it was that size, it would stay that size. And then I could flip it back to full screen mode and it would say it would auto format it to the closest resolution it could find. But I had to do this every time I opened the game. Yeah. Some of my issues may be the fact that I, I purposely run everything in a uh, borderless window. I was trying to do that. I, I, I run everything in borderless window when I could get a crop, get when I could, when I can manage it. Me too. But I, I fought with it for a while. Cause yeah, I was going to be a total non-starter by trying to play this game in 640 by 480. Yes. I'm surprised it even goes down that low of a resolution. Right? It looks like butts, but it does. Um, no, it was, it was pretty funny because when I, when you, when I took a 640 by 480, when I put it into windows mode, it was 640 by 480. Like it flipped into my 4k monitor. So it was like the size of a playing card. (laughs) And then we, we fixed it. Um, but yeah, so that was, I basically played through the whole game in like two or three sittings because actually starting it was an ordeal by the way. And I, the irony of me saying this is palpable even to me. But by the way, once I have watched your splash screens the first time, I don't need to watch them again. Yes. Do not make me sit through 45 seconds of splash screens every time I open your game. The first time, sure. Every other time, that is what the escape button is for. Yeah, making those non-skippable makes me very, very angry. Because if you don't, what I'm going to do is go into the game files and delete them. Especially if I'm in there already trying to get your game to work. I mean, I feel like both Bethesda and Bioware are bad about this. Yes. Now, to be fair, once it once I did get it to a to a decent resolution, it play it ran like a dream. Like it ran really, really well as soon as it was in the right thing. The the graphics looked fantastic. Like it looked really, really good once it was doing the right thing. And and I had no frame rate dips. Yeah, it did. It was very, very good at that. Did want to fly one of those helicopters though. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad it didn't do that though. I hate flying vehicles in games. Oh, like, like I, 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 I hate it when a game makes me do that. I, I deeply miss the era of uh, Battlefield 2142 where you could fly troop transports around because I totally did that. It was so awesome. I lived for flying vehicles in especially multiplayer games where the other people on my team can hop in them and I can fly them around. Yeah, I like I quickly checked out of the Battlefield franchise because there was a point where I had just gotten sick of working my ass off to storm a hill and take a, a an obstacle only to get hit by a vehicle that I couldn't even see on screen. This has been an extremely meandery <laughs> game of the I, month show. A bit. I kind of figured we'd have a lot to talk about with this one. Well, no, I mean, like, like we've been meandering far off topic, too, so... Well, I also figured that there might be stuff to talk about outside <sighs> of the game. There's a lot yeah. going on. Uh, but I guess, are we ready to wrap up? Probably. Probably so. Uh, final thoughts. I liked it. I think I love it's this a game. very good game. This is a solid game that is definitely worth playing yeah i, I, I enjoy, I enjoy it. a lot i there's there's a lot of things that i there's a lot of things that frustrate me about it but there's nothing after after i got through the first part there was nothing that made me like stop and be like no i don't want to play this anymore um and it has some it has some genuinely really good moments and like really clever clever bits for me this is one of those games that like there's a handful of them where if it goes on sale, I tweet out that it's on sale and that people should pick it up because this is absolutely one of those games. Like, I feel like it's worth playing regardless of whether you had experience with the Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein franchise at all. I mean, there are certain aspects of it that are a little bit more payoffish if you had played the 2009 Wolfenstein game. I didn't even know there was a 2009 Wolfenstein game. Yo, 
most I think most people didn't notice that there was a 2009 Wolfenstein game. It was a problem. It wasn't a great game. But yeah, there's like lots of Easter eggs scattered through for people who've played not just the 2009 one. So, but yeah, like missing those won't hurt your enjoyment of the game any. And up next month, Grace's pick. Grace is not here tonight, but we're playing Subnautica. Yay, Subnautica. We go under the sea to explore. I don't know much about this game. I'm looking forward to trying it. It is an underwater survival game. Yep. So you build bases and stuff. You've basically crashed on this water world and you have a vehicle that, you know, you can use as kind of a base of operations as you go explore, but then things happen and you need to not be in that vehicle anymore. So it's interesting. Like it's, it's a, uh, it's not really a Minecrafty type game in its, in its entirety, but it does offer some of those sandbox exploration. So what, it'll be interesting. What you're, what you're describing sounds a lot like No Man's Sky, but hopefully good. It's it's kind of No Man's Ocean. Yeah, and among other things, it's a very, very pretty game. Th- this is going to be a game where I have to basically, like, fight my own fears. Because, like, I have a fear of the ocean. Like, I it, it, it squigs me out trying to play this game. And there are giant toothy fishes that want to... Yes. Play. Like I, I will hear, I will hear, <laughs> I will hear sounds off in the distance, and my instinct is to run like hell for the pod and hide. This is also a game that is still in early access. It's been in early access for like fifty years at this point, but honestly, it's been playable for like forty-eight of those years. Yeah, and I largely and... think it's in in early access only so that they have an excuse that if there is a good reason, they can do character wipes. Yeah, because they've they've already done this once where they had to completely reformat the way that the characters were saved. And yeah, uh, like I, I know Grace went through a period where she like had to start completely over. Yeah, because they've done that and they've like rebuilt the map a couple of times. And I gather in one of the most recent updates, they like added an actual story to the game beyond just you've crashed and try to survive. So that's uh, interesting. I heard a lot of really good things about it. Or really interesting things. But anyway, we will be playing that over the next month, so hopefully you will join us. And also, I am curious to find out what people thought of Wolfenstein New Order, because I freaking love this game, and it seemed like most of us at least gave it a thumbs up. So it would be interesting, oh, yeah, especially if you positive. didn't like it, to find out why you didn't like it. Yes, if you hate why? this game, please tell us why, and so we can understand why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm not gonna go that far. Not even I mean, a little. like this game. This game for me is a solid B, but I also feel like a lot of games don't make that bar. And I like, you know, I I feel like, like I feel like it is really like you don't like shooters, and this game will be pretty frustrating. But like, what, me? No, 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 no. Or no, if, if no, if you like, if you don't like shooter, yeah. If you don't like shooters, then yeah, this is gonna be frustrating. I'm sure if Ash were on and had played it, he would probably have some things to say. But we can talk about that later. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week for a normal one. Good night. Good night. Good night.